everyone, Hungry Reader here. If there's one thing that readers of The Last Generation can all agree on, it's that we all loved the Harry Potter books. But if you're like me, there's one part of the Harry Potter series that never really clicked with you, and that was... Harry Potter. Oh, I love the Wizarding World, don't get me wrong. I love Hogwarts and Chocolate Frogs and Horcruxes and all that, but I was honestly never all that invested in the story that was being told there. Knowing how much more was out there, this little magical squabble on a little island north of France seemed more like a distraction from the main event. Truthfully, I was hoping you-know-who would triumph over you-know-who else, and the conflict would go global. This is why I, like the rest of the internet, am so excited that they're finally going to make a movie of my favorite book in the whole Harry Potter series, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. There is more legends, lore, and history of the wizarding world packed into this short textbook than you found in an actual Harry Potter book, even after the books got as long as the first three books combined. That's why I'm going to be counting down the top however many monsters I want to see in the movie. We'll call it The Hunger Reader's Top However Many, or The THRTHM. <laughs> Number first, the Dirac Hall seems very likely to end up in the movie, being the only fantastic beast that you can go see at the Smithsonian. Dirac Hall is just the wizarding world's word for what we would call the dodo. However, wizards don't consider their bird to be extinct. The reason dodos didn't fly is apparently they could simply teleport to safety, which is why no one has seen one in over 450 years. But the wizards decided that the lesson that we learned about endangered species was too important to let us in on the gag. Oh, wizards. Light years ahead of us on ecological matters, yet their periodic table still contains fire. Number next. What we've got here is a sort of magic-using ape. Maybe a clue to the parallel evolution of wizards and muggles? The demiguise is graceful, shy, and harmless to humans. There's no need to hide them from muggles because they can disappear whenever they like, which is usually always. Unfortunately, their pelts are in high demand to make invisibility cloaks, which means that Harry was actually wearing the skin of a great ape in the books. Oh, well, it's still better than that vest that Voldemort was so proud of for some reason. Number then. I put pretty high odds on this monster making it into the movie since... Some monsters get as little as a paragraph, but this one gets two pages. In Dungeons & Dragons, there are two monsters that masquerade as part of the room. The Lurker Above, which pretends to be a ceiling, and the Trapper, which pretends to be a floor. But if you really want to furnish your Pee-wee's playhouse of death, you need Leatherfolds. Monsters that eat people and look like sheets and curtains. They creep up on sleeping wizards and engulf them like amoebas, not even leaving bones or hair or clothes behind. The only way to knock them off is with the Patronus Charm, which, if you're not familiar, launches your spirit animal out of your wand. Although I imagine any method of launching an animal at it would probably work. Number also... Here's something cute and harmless and adorable and really marketable, so you know it's going to be in the movie. A puff skein is really just a cuddly little ball of fur. It's like a tribble without the oppressive reproductive techniques, or a weeple but without the eyes and feet and antennae and sign that serves the world's greatest administrative technician. What the puff skein has is a super long tongue that goes probing around for bugs to eat, but if it can't find bugs, it will happily eat boogers fresh from the wizard's nose. That seems like a really dangerous feature to try to work into the inevitable plush toys. But I'll bet they'll be able to make a great iOS game out of it. Number T-O-O -O. The Harry Potter series introduced us to parcel mouths, which are certain people with the ability to talk to snakes. But it's not a learned skill, it's a congenital ability, it's like being double-jointed. Of course, the real surprise is that snakes can talk at all. This brings us to the Rune Spore, which is a three-headed snake whose heads constantly converse with one another. The central head sees, smells, and analyzes, while the left head hears and makes decisions. And the right head? Well, that one's the critic. His role is to mock and heckle everything the other two heads do. 
So if any character in the new movie is a parcel mouth, they'll be able to hear and understand everything their pet Runespoor says, and maybe explain to us why the left and center heads inevitably bite off the right one. Number including... Well, it wouldn't really be a fancy movie if it didn't have a dragon, would it? So I picked the dragon from the book that seems the most original and the most terrifying. Your typical dragon resembles a snake or a featherless dinosaur, but the Ukrainian iron belly is so named because it literally resembles a pot-bellied stove. It may look comical because it's so rotund that it waddles while it flies, but the iron belly is one of the most unstoppable dragons. It can weigh as much as two elephants, and is known to land on houses and boats to crush them. Now, supposedly, we already saw a Ukrainian iron belly in one of the movies. It was the dragon that was guarding the Gringotts Bank. But according to the fans, that dragon looked more like an Antipodian opal eye, a dragon also described in this book. More importantly, though, the dragon's species was never identified in the original book, so it totally doesn't count! Number Don't Forget! In the Dungeons and Dragons Monster Manual, most monsters can be likened to a more familiar, less magical kind of animal that you already know, like I just did with dragons. As if you didn't know dragons. The ones that can't be likened to any animal, like the Beholder and the Otiug and such, are referred to as aberrations. And boy, here's an aberration for you. The Quintiped, also known as the Harry McBoon, is a big frowny face on five stumpy legs that eats people. It's like a harvestman, except it harvests men. It's called a Harry McBoon because, according to legend, they were once a clan of Scottish witches, the McBoons, who were cursed by another family that they feuded with. Don't you love how wizards actually live among things like unicorns and dragons, but they still have their own legends and tall tales that nobody really takes seriously? Do you think maybe the Scoutmaster might tell the story of how he once saw a vaccination? Or your grandpa might spin yarns about having once encountered a wild iTunes. Now, I love the Harry McBoons so much, I actually hope they're the main thrust of the movie's plot. You know, like Newt Scamander could arrive at their deserted moor with the intent to interview one, and then he'd have to go off looking for another monster that was powerful enough to subdue a Harry McBoon. Maybe I just like saying Harry McBoon. And never last but not least... Living as we do outside the Harry Potter universe, looking into it as if into a fishbowl, we know one thing that the wizards would never admit to themselves. Quidditch is really stupid. More than anything, it's that game-breaking 150 points awarded when you catch the Golden Snitch that completely negates any goals that were scored, and inevitably just makes it a contest between the two seekers. But, with the release of Fantastic Beasts, and its companion book, Quidditch Through the Ages, Rowling finally explained why Quidditch is so broken and unbalanced. Snidgets are harmless little spherical hummingbirds who are astonishingly agile flyers. That made them the target of an inhumane pastime of the 10th century called Snidget hunting. While Quidditch was in its infancy, a high-stakes game happened to collide with the gruesome sport of hunting the Snidget. A reward of 150 wizard fun bucks was offered to the Quidditch player who could catch the bird, and it's still part of the scoring system to this day. But the more Quidditch games were played, the more Snidgets were killed. So the wizards levied another of their remarkably far-sighted Endangered Species Acts, making Snidget hunting illegal and necessitating the invention of the Golden Snitch. And that's exactly why I want the Snidget to be featured in the movie. The story of the Snidget as told in these two books, tells you something vital about the Harry Potter universe. Wizards are not better than muggles. The wizards of the wizarding world are just as vulnerable to willful ignorance, prejudice, and bread and circuses as anyone who can't pick up a stick and shoot a glowing moose out of it. Even the ones who aren't explicitly hand-wringingly evil. And that is what I'm looking forward to the most about the Fantastic Beasts movie. The story about the ordinary people who live in this extraordinary world. Not the child of prophecy, the grown-ups who wrote the prophecy in the first place. Here's to the Fantastic Beasts movie. Raise your pumpkin juice high.
Ah! <laughs>